Pluto is dead. These were the words of Mike Brown, the famous astronomer who, uh, back in 2006, announced that he thinks Pluto should not be a planet anymore, and we know how that went. But why exactly did he say that, and is there actually any reason to not consider Pluto to be a planet? Let's talk about this in this video. Welcome to What the Math. And we're actually going to talk about both Pluto and Ceres because I've recently read a really interesting article by another um, astronomer slash professor who talks about or talked about uh, both Ceres and Pluto as he thinks they should still uh, be considered planets and I'll explain to you why I kind of agree with him. Uh, you can actually read his article in uh, in the link that I provided in the description below. Alright, so first of all let's start with the definition of what planets are after the 2006 conference. Oh, and by the way, in Universe Sandbox 2, if you actually look at the planets, Pluto is still a planet. It's considered to be a planet under their definition as well. Anyway, so to be a planet, like for example, Mars right here, uh, what uh, you have to have is, first of all, you have to be orbiting the Sun in an elliptical orbit. So all eight planets have an elliptical orbit around the star, but many other objects do as well, for example, Vesta and Ceres. The second part of definition is uh, related to the shape of the object. Any object that is massive enough, when it has enough mass, it will actually acquire a spherical shape, it will become a ball. So Mars is a ball, Mars is relatively spherical, so it also meets the definition of uh, a planet. But then again, so does Ceres. Ceres is actually massive enough for it to be spherical. However, Vesta is not. Vesta is actually not entirely spherical. But then if we actually look at Pluto, uh, Pluto, as we recently have found out, is almost spherical as well. So uh, both uh, Pluto and Ceres meet that definition as well. However, many other objects like, for example, Haumea, Varuna and also Vesta will not meet this definition because they're not entirely spherical and have a relatively prolonged shape because uh, either they're spinning too fast or they are actually essentially kind of like space potatoes, they don't actually have enough mass to form a spherical shape. But then there's another third definition that, that was added in 2006, and this is what we're going to talk about today. The third definition is this, the object should have cleared its neighborhood of other objects. So in other words, it should be the only object in this orbit. So as you can see, Earth is the only object, Venus is as well, Mercury and Mars. But in case of Ceres, it has its friend Vesta and a few other asteroids that actually don't appear in this particular simulation, but we're going to make them appear in this other one. So right here, we can kind of see the four biggest objects in, um, in the asteroid belt. We have uh, two Pallas, one Ceres, um, four Vesta and ten Hygieia. The number refers to when they were were discovered, or I guess the order in which they were discovered. This was the first discovered, this was uh, the second, this was the fourth, and this was the tenth. Now, um, so here comes the interesting part. Uh, obviously Pluto has some objects in its vicinity as well. As a matter of fact, you can kind of see quite a lot of different objects orbiting in the same kind of uh, vicinity, but let's actually look at Pluto. So Pluto is amongst many other objects that are in the system. Actually, there's a lot more that I'm not even showing you because my computer will probably not be able to handle all of them, but I'm going to try it in a few seconds. But basically, yeah, so th there's Pluto here and there's clearly quite a lot of other objects, but the objects that are relatively close to Pluto, like for example, uh, this right here that doesn't even have a name or this right here that doesn't even have a name. Most of these objects are a little bit too small. Uh, like this one is only about uh, 230 kilometers in radius, meaning that they're not massive enough to assume a spherical shape. As a matter of fact, the only object in this vicinity uh, within a, a radius of about, I don't know, two, three astronomical units, uh, Pluto is the only other object, uh, um, along with its um, moon Charon, uh, the only other object that actually has a spherical shape. Uh, so here is actually all of the dwarf planets. And my computer is about to get super slow because there's like thousands of them here. Uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on in this area where Pluto is. And this is actually what we refer to as uh, the Kuiper's Belt. Or, or I guess you can also call it Trans-Neptunian area because it's basically right after Neptune. Uh, but uh, we call this uh, essentially Pluto's neighborhood. However, to be honest or to be fair, this is a little bit of a large neighborhood to consider. Basically, putting all of these objects in one sort of 
area is not fair for Pluto. Like, just because there's other objects like Aries and Haumea that are relatively large in this particular vicinity, it doesn't really mean that Pluto should not be considered to be a planet. But let's not rush ahead, let's actually talk about things a little bit slower. So first of all, let's do a bit of history. Back in the days, specifically in 1800s, uh, we found Ceres and we've discovered this missing planet that we thought was in this area between Mars and Jupiter and we were very happy. Then, within the next uh, few decades after that, we've discovered a few more planets and by uh, the year 1847, there were actually 11 planets in our system and the actual astronomical maps were quite different. In other words, if you were a child in uh, mid 1800s you had to learn 11 planets you had to know that there were 11 planets in our system and each of them even had a planetary symbol which is kind of cool so there was um obviously v uh, mercury venus earth and mars but then there were also Vesta, Juno, Ceres, and Pallas, but we didn't actually discover Pluto until 1930, so Pluto was not on that list. Uh, so it was a pretty interesting list of planets, and then back in, um, I think it was 1850, uh, astronomers decided to talk about this because they kept discovering more and more, um, I guess you would call them large objects in this area, and then they decided to just kind of assign a new term to them and this is how the term asteroid or star-like were born and the reason why they were called star-like is because when the astronomers were looking um, at these objects using their telescopes they kind of looked like small stars they were star-like and so they decided to name them asteroid but here's the thing about these particular asteroids so okay with most of them it makes sense that we call them asteroids they're very large rocks and they're relatively big in size but uh, Ceres, along with Pluto, actually share a very significant characteristic that other asteroids don't have. They are significantly larger and more massive than other objects in the same orbit. So here are the four largest asteroids in that, in that region, uh, so we have Hygieia, Vesta, Pallas, and um, Ceres. And as you can see, Ceres is a very, very large brother of them. As a matter of fact, uh, if you combine all of the asteroids together, uh, one third of the entire mass will be Ceres, and about one half uh, of the entire asteroid belt is right here. This is essentially half of asteroid belt, uh, not including, obviously, smaller asteroids. But Ceres is significantly more massive. And there you go, there's collisions there, because I didn't really place them in a very stable orbit around one another. Uh, so, if I go back to the original simulation, and compare Vesta and Ceres in terms of mass, uh, Ceres is about four times more massive than Vesta. And uh, on top of that, obviously, it has a spherical shape, and on top of that, it obviously is orbiting the Sun. So, okay, so maybe it's just not massive enough to kick uh, its neighbors out. Maybe it's just not massive enough to clear the neighborhood. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it does seem to actually fit the planetary description. All right, so maybe not Ceres, but let's look at Pluto again. So we're going to go to Pluto, which is actually even more massive than, uh, than Ceres. I'm going to actually do a comparison here again. So we're going to put Pluto in the middle and now we're going to have Ceres orbiting Pluto. So you can see that it's actually even more massive and larger than Ceres. And on, just on top of that, so here is Pallas and um, let's put the other four asteroids here as well. And so you can see that uh, Pluto is actually massive enough to kind of handle them, to not be distracted by them and to basically uh, have them as its own moons. Uh, so Pluto is essentially a very, very massive and also relatively large object. Uh, its diameter is about 2300 kilometers. We have a few other objects in uh, the so-called Kuiper's Belt that are uh, just as big and possibly even as massive as Pluto. And specifically here I'm talking about two objects that come to mind and they are right here on the list as well. We have Sedna, which is just a little bit smaller than Pluto. We have Sedna and we also have Ares, which is actually just as big as Pluto. Uh, so, oh no, there's some collisions going on there. So here are some of the other potential planets that I think should be considered to be planets. And I'll explain to you why in a few seconds when uh, when I go back to the original simulation. So why, why should they actually be considered to be planets? So the definition basically says, uh, you know, you have to be able to clear the neighborhood of any other object, any other body. And basically you have to be the only object present um, in the vicinity, in the orbit. And here's the thing about Pluto, Aries, and Sedna. 
the three objects I've just mentioned that I think should technically be considered to be planets. If you look at them, they're in completely different orbits, in completely different neighborhoods. They're not even close to each other. As a matter of fact, um, Aries is farther away from Pluto than Pluto is from the Sun. Even the cl some of the closest objects to Pluto, like for example, Qu uh, Quar, that's right here, uh, if you look at the actual difference in terms of distances between them, so the semi-major axis for Quawar is 43 astronomical units, meaning that this is 43 astronomical units, whereas for Pluto, it is approximately 40 astronomical units. So there is actually, uh, the, the smallest distance between them is 3 astronomical units. That is essentially the same distance as, or almost the same distance as from Earth to Jupiter. If that's the neighborhood, that is a very, very large neighborhood. I don't think it's actually fair to to basically assign these large distances and call them neighborhoods for uh, objects like Pluto. And in this particular plane, in this particular orbit, there is really not that much present. So um, let's just look at some of the other objects, like for example, Aries and Sedna. And so here... So here, Sedna seems to be pretty lonely and doesn't really have anything to interact with. Maybe we still haven't found the objects, but nothing massive enough and, and spherical enough to be considered to be a planet. Um, so uh, Eris is in the same boat, doesn't really have anything in this particular orbit. And uh, for the most part, other objects uh, that you know might be in the neighborhood would be considered to be very large asteroids, but not really planets because they're not spherical. And so I guess the question here is, so what exactly is this neighborhood that needs to be cleared? We need to have a definition for this neighborhood, because uh, without this definition, you could say that none of these are planets. Uh, I could, you know, say that uh, Uranus and Neptune are basically the neighborhood, so they're technically not planets because they're close enough, or I guess they're closer enough together than Aries and Sedna. And here's actually another problem on top of that. So, okay, so let's just say, all right, so this is the neighborhood and it needs to be cleared and basically to be a planet, you have to be able to clear this neighborhood. So let's just try something different. Let's take the biggest planet that we have, specifically, we're going to take Jupiter and place it in the so-called neighborhood of Pluto at a distance of about, I don't know, 30-ish astronomical units from the sun. So assuming that this definition is correct, Within the next, um, I guess, thousands, millions, billions of years, Jupiter should be able to clear the entire Kuiper's belt. If it's a, you know, if, if it meets the definition of a planet, it needs to be able to clear this. Now, I've done this before, so this is why I feel pretty confident that it's not going to happen. Um, it will obviously clear some of the parts, some of the asteroids will start flying away. And even some of the um, so-called dwarf planets and the large asteroids in this particular area will also uh, get affected by it. They'll change their orbits a little bit. They'll get into resonance with Jupiter. But none of them will really disappear. None of them will actually fly into the outer solar system. I've tried this maybe three, four times, and I've ran this overnight even. And uh, Jupiter was not really good at removing the objects from this system, from this so-called neighborhood. And this is where I guess uh, this definition really breaks down. It really doesn't make sense to call Kuiper's Belt a neighborhood. You can call, I guess, a certain orbital parameter a neighborhood. You can call maybe a vicinity of a planet a neighborhood. But Kuiper's Belt and even the asteroid belt is a very large neighborhood to basically be considered uh, an area for, uh, for a planet to clear. So, you know, if the largest planet in our solar system is having trouble clearing this neighborhood, why should we not consider Pluto to be a planet? And not just Pluto, obviously also Aries and possibly Sedna, as long as they're spherical, since they're actually orbiting the sun, and as long as they're massive enough, obviously, to, to have a spherical shape, or I guess the more scientific term would be acquiring a hydrostatic equilibrium, as long as they have that, they should be considered to be planets. And to be honest, I'm actually not the only one who thinks that way. As a matter of fact, the only reason why uh, Pluto lost its status is because... Um, so in 2006, they had an astronomical conference, and uh, on the last day of conference, when most people already left, they decided to hold this referendum and, I guess, uh, decided to vote on whether Pluto should maintain its planetary status. And so out of 424 astronomers, about 270 astronomers voted uh, that Pluto should not be a planet, and about 150 astronomers voted that it should be a planet. But here's the tricky part. The majority of astronomers have already left the conference. They didn't even get a chance to vote. As a matter of fact, most of them didn't even know that the vote will take place, and actually possibly didn't really get to participate in this particular vote. 
There are actually over 12,000 members in the IAU, also known as International Astronomical Union, and only 424 of them got to vote. That is actually less than 5% of the entire union, and it really doesn't represent anyone, actually, to be honest. It doesn't actually make it democratic at all. And surprisingly, even after 10 years, so now it's, uh, what, 2016, even after 10 years, they didn't actually re-vote on this really kind of a controversial and somewhat touchy um, subject. And actually, even the person who was responsible for the New Horizons mission, Alan Stern, once said that this was actually very embarrassing for the Astronomical Society to, to have voted on this issue so um, unfairly, because the, the majority of people never got to vote, and the majority of the astronomers around the world might actually disagree with the idea of Pluto not being a planet. And so just to summarize all of this, and just to summarize the ideas, First of all, uh, there's quite a lot of astronomers that still think Pluto is a planet, and they would even add a few other objects to this list, including Ceres, Ares, and uh, possibly even Sedna. Secondly, one of the reasons why Pluto should technically still be a planet is because if you look at its orbit, there is really nothing major in its neighborhood that it needs to clear. It's doing perfectly fine in its orbit, there is nothing within about one astronomical unit that sort of contends it to be a planet as well, uh, except for, of course for its moon uh, Charon, which would technically maybe make it sort of like a, a dual planetary system, which, be, which would actually be pretty cool to have a dual planetary system in our solar system, right? Uh, secondly, which is actually a topic I haven't mentioned in this video, but if you look at our solar system, every major planet also has other bodies orbiting in its sort of orbital path. Uh, there are other asteroids that share the path with Earth. As a matter of fact, we've recently discovered that Earth may have this uh, temporary second moon that I've talked about previously in one of the videos, which is actually an asteroid that has almost exactly the same orbit as Earth. So Earth hasn't actually cleared its neighborhood yet either. Does that mean that Earth is not a planet? Well, no, of course it doesn't. And third, if I place a very large object in the Kuiper's belt, specifically if I place Jupiter here, it will not really do a good job at clearing everything either. So I can spend billions of years here, and what will end up happening is that Jupiter will probably change the orbits of other objects, it will probably um, help other objects achieve resonance with it, but it's not going to clear this area. It's going to clear a bit of it, but not everything. And so, because of all of this, I personally think, I am going to agree with the person whose article I posted in the description below, that Ceres, Pluto, Ares, and possibly Sedna should technically be considered to be planets. And possibly some other objects that have achieved spherical shape and have no other objects present in the vicinity of, let's just say, approximately one astronomical unit. Anyway, so what do you guys think? Post your comments and post your opinions in the description below. Would you be okay with having like 10, 11, 12 planets in our solar system rather than having just 8? And would it actually be more realistic for us to re-vote on this somewhat interesting but I guess somewhat controversial issue? Let me know what you think, post your comments, and we'll talk about this in the comment box below. And thank you so much for watching, and if you still haven't subscribed, please subscribe and share this video with your friends and possibly someone else who you think may enjoy this video. Like this video if you enjoyed watching it, and come back for more astronomical, space, science, or math videos that this channel always has. I'll see you guys in the next video, game you later, and as always, bye bye and hopefully one day Pluto becomes a planet again so that I can actually not feel bad about having this old planetary poster on my wall that I haven't thrown away from my childhood. Pluto, I miss you. You're still a planet in my heart.